Uh, thanks for, for joining. Uh, my name is uh, Howard Wall. I'm the director of the Hammond Institute for Free Enterprise here at Lindenwood and in the Plaster School of Business and Entrepreneurship. And I'd like to you know, welcome you to the, our first virtual uh, event in the, the HF Langenberg Memorial Speaker Series. Now, in, in case you haven't uh, joined us before, the Hammond Institute is, let's see, now all of you should be muting, right? The, the Hammond Institute is, uh, was founded in 2013 with the mission of fostering free enterprise and a civil and religious liberty through the examination of market-oriented approaches to economic and social issues. And as I said, this is our latest audition of the HF Langenberg Memorial Speaker Series, which has been around for, I think, three or four years. And the goal of the speaker series is to provide members of the St. Louis area community with an opportunity to hear leading intellectuals. So Steve and Jeremy, you are leading intellectuals today uh, and to engage in uh, you know, vigorous discussion and debate. So the, the emphasis, and it's gonna, we're gonna try to do that uh, tonight through Zoom is on discussion, right? So we're gonna leave a, a significant portion of the time for uh, for Q&A, and we'll see a lot of discussion between the, the, the two speakers. Now, as I said, this is our first virtual event, and we decided to, you know, take advantage of the opportunities. In some ways, this, uh, you know, has some pluses. Unfortunately, we can't all join together to, uh, you know, to network and to uh, sp speak to one another, but on the other hand, we'll be able to use the chat room, and everyone can talk uh, you know, whisper to their, their neighbor and to everybody else who's, who's attending. So in some ways there's an advantage and we also have a much wider audience. We've, uh, we have people from outside St. Louis who otherwise wouldn't be able to, to join us. So we welcome uh, all of you to, to Lindenwood and, and St. Charles, Missouri. Now, uh, let you know that we'll be recording the event and we'll be sending out the link to all of you so that you can, you can share it. You can watch it again too, if you'd like but you can share it with anyone you, you think might be, be interested. Now I'm going to share my screen and we'll run through a few things and I'll introduce our speakers. All right, so as I said, welcome. And our discussion today is gonna to be on a, a topic that I think every one of us has a, a strong opinion on. We've, it certainly touched all of us and affected us in a, in a lot of different ways. COVID-19, and in particular, we're going to be discussing the policy trade-offs. And uh, we have economists, so trade-offs are our, trade -offs are our, our business. And uh, I think our two speakers will have very different views on the policy trade-offs that have been done so far. Uh, but also a lot of overlapping views. So it's important also to not just find the disagreements, but also the, the areas of agreement. And our two speakers are uh, Jeremy Horpadal, who is an assistant professor of economics in, at the University of Central Arkansas and a scholar at the Arkansas Center for Research and Economics. His research has been published in Economic Journal Watch, Constitutional Political Economy and other journals. And he's published op-eds in a variety of regional and national publications. I'll also note he's a good Twitter follower if you're on Twitter. If you have the great misfortune of being on Twitter, you should at least follow uh, Jeremy. Uh, Stephen Miller, he joins us from uh, Troy University in Alabama, and he is the Adams Bibby Chair of Free Enterprise and Associate Professor of Economics. And his research is on the economics of politics and individual beliefs. And he's published in a lot of journals too. And he's smart enough to not be on Twitter. Um, and I'll, I'll point out since uh, people, are, they are kind of taking a stake. If you're familiar with the Great Barrington Declaration, uh, Steve is a signatory to that. So he's staked out his position. Now, before we, we start, I'm gonna introduce a little bit of the data just so that we're all up to speed. The, if you wanna think of what the debate is or what their views are, you can think of Taiwan versus Sweden. So um, Steve is much more in favor of an approach like Sweden has taken, which we'll call it kind of a more open or focused protection. And Jeremy has maybe a more, uh, uh, he might use focused also, but he'd probably have different focus or a wider focus on what, what he would well, want the government to be doing. 
Now, uh, since we, we planned on having this event, there have been a lot of changes, mostly bad changes in terms of how the pandemic has been going in the US and worldwide. As you can see here, uh, cases in the US have really shot up in the last month or so. And we're now having record high seven day moving averages. Now, part of that is wider testing, but the, the rate of positives is also going up. So it's not just testing. And uh, deaths have started to rise a little bit, but uh, not nearly as much as cases so far. Now here in Missouri, I keep my eye on this every day. We also have seen an increase in cases that's been pretty steady. But you know, if we put this in perspective with other states, it's not nearly as high as what other states have seen. It's higher than what, what we've seen. But cases and deaths have both been kind of creeping up over the last couple of months. And in St. Louis, we've had a, after a quiet period, uh, a bit of a spike up getting near to our, our record, record highs. Now, a lot of the discussion that you'll be hearing is about what's happening internationally. So thought I would just present a picture to show what's going on because uh, Europe has experienced what you could call a, a second wave. So Belgium in particular and some other countries, uh, big spike in cases, France also, United Kingdom, and all of them are uh, having more cases per day than the US you know, controlling for population. And you'll see the other countries that we'll be talking about are much lower down there. Sweden and Germany are doing about the same now and New Zealand and Taiwan have been uh, seen as relative uh, success stories. And they've, they've had very few cases or deaths over the last few months. And you see deaths have started to rise uh, also. So things are not really going well overall, but uh, as we'll, we'll see that there are, you know, it's, it is, uh, there are a lot of differences across places in the US. It's not everywhere that's seeing increases. It's the, the Northern Midwest, uh, whereas previously it had been the South and before that was the, the Northeast. Now, I wanna give some housekeeping and some helpful hints with Zoom so that we can make the best of what we have. So you'll have the pleasure of seeing two pictures of me here. I had to put both on here to show all of the features. Now, to get the best experience, you should First, select a speaker view. So if you see everyone at once, then that's the gallery view, I think. And you might want the speaker view, which would mean only the speaker is highlighted, everybody else is, is small. Also, if you're not muted, you should do so. Uh, Matt Adams, who is running things behind the scenes, will go and mute you anyway, but you know, you'd be better off muting yourself you know, so you're not uh, forced to do it. So go ahead and, and mute. And you should join the chat. You know, you feel free to chat amongst yourselves. And that's also the way to ask questions. So down in the middle, if you hover over your Zoom window, uh, uh, the push the chat button and then the uh, chat will, will appear on the right side. So you'll, you'll be able to see what everybody's saying. And you can also then join in and, and chat yourself. And you can keep your video on if you'd like you'll, you know, everyone can, can see you. And that's, you know, so we're trying to make it like we're all in one giant room here. So uh, that's fine if you'd like to keep your video on. It's also fine if you'd like to, to shut it off. If you're, uh, you know, if you still haven't gotten over your pajamas, well, it's a little, little late for that. Now also you might wanna see who else is, is participating. You know, we have a lot of participants. So if you click the participants, participants button, if you hover, then you'll see a list of them showing up on the right side. And then you can see who you want to, uh, want to chat with. Now our questions, we'll be dealing with that through the chat. If you go down to the button to uh, communicate, you can chat with the group by choosing uh, everyone. But if you wanna ask me a question, go and select, ask a question. So that's me. And you can see right now, my name is ask a question. So, that will be a question that comes to me and then I'll take notes of the questions. And then when I'm asking the questions of the speakers, I'll have, uh, have yours in front of me so that we can cull through and, and get some of the topics that you're, you're most interested in. Now, as always, try to stay connected with us. We're on all of the social media. Uh, certainly if you go to our website, HammondInstitute.org, you can find all of these, these links and you can sign up for our uh, email list so that you can keep up with what we're, what we're doing. So without any, any further ado, uh, I'd like to welcome 
Steve and Jeremy. And I'll stop sharing, right? And Steve and Jeremy, are you there? If you talk, you'll show up. Yeah, thank you, Howard. Happy to be here. I'm Jeremy Horpadal. It's nice to see everyone. Hi, I'm Steve Miller. Good to be here. Okay, thanks, guys. Now, the way we're going to run things is I have some very general questions for the for the speakers, just like three of them, and then some follow up questions just for them to describe what their views are, and then have a little bit of back and forth between themselves. And uh, they're going to take turns, I'm going to ask Steve first, and then uh, Jeremy will will have his turn after that. And it'll just be a few minutes each as we go through just these three questions and some some discussion to set up the Q&A. And as this is going on, as I said, if you think of any questions, send them to me through the, the chat. All right, so Steve, you're up first. And the question I have is, well, what is it that you think, All right? So you've you've said you favor something like the Swedish model and you've signed up for the, or onto the, the, the Great Barrington uh, Declaration. So in a few minutes, what does that mean to you? What sorts of policies do you think we should be having? And the focus here is on the public health aspect of it. We'll talk about the economic aspects of it later, but why you think what your approach is and why you think it's the, the best approach for dealing with the public health crisis that we have. Okay, Howard, thank you. Uh, so the approach I favor is called focused protection. And the basic idea is to shift risk from high risk people, vulnerable people, to lower risk, less vulnerable people. There, there, there's obviously no such thing as an invulnerable person. And there's no such thing as, well, maybe there is such a thing as a totally perfectly vulnerable person, I'm not sure, but it's a spectrum. But generally speaking, the idea, idea is to shift risk more than has been done from the most vulnerable to the less vulnerable. So how does that work? Well. One thing would be to take a lot of things that are going on right now, a lot of, a lot of approaches that individuals are taking, some approaches that uh, public health officials are taking and focus them more on the vulnerable. So prioritize testing, for example. And, and instead of prioritizing it based on symptoms or exposure, prioritize testing first. It can, it can address those other things, but first prioritize testing based on risk. Test high risk people, and those who live or work with the high risk people, such as workers in long-term care facilities. That's very important. More frequent, regular testing, that should be a top priority for testing. Uh, the same focus approach goes for personal protective equipment. When high risk people are in contact with low risk people, masks probably aren't enough. You probably wanna go quite a bit farther than that. So I should be protected right? Distance should be maintained. And again, as much as possible, focus testing on those interactions. For short periods of time, uh, when metrics show rapid outbreaks are occurring, I, I myself would say focusing not so much on case growth, but on hospitalization increases. The vulnerable should consider, should seriously consider self-isolating as much as possible. Uh, that may be extreme, but it would be for a focused short period of time. Uh, another thing would be as much as is possible in, in, in civil society, and I suppose if you want the government to do this sort of thing, find ways to offer leeway for older workers to work from home. Find ways to support that. That can be private initiatives. If, if you insist, then government support should be focused in that direction offering leeway for older workers to work from home, focus on personal protective uh, equipment and distancing for those workers, for those older workers, those more vulnerable workers, not on all workers. The virus does not go away with this approach, but the idea is that once herd immunity is reached, it's not like the virus goes away. It's not like therefore everybody is immune. What happens is, it shifts from being an epidemic, right? From an epidemic form to an endemic form, which then has a much lower transmission rate, much lower numbers of hospitalizations, much less stress on the healthcare system and much fewer deaths. 
Why do I think it's better? Well, it does reduce economic costs. Well, I mean, we can talk more about that later, but obviously what it means is more businesses than do now can operate more relatively normally with focus protection for vulnerable employees and vulnerable clients and customers, maybe even saying, look, if you view yourself as vulnerable or you're constantly or frequently in contact with people who are vulnerable, don't come, we have another option for you. Uh, business will still be slower because the vulnerable will be avoiding certain settings. Uh, big reason why I think it's better is it reduces long run public health problems. More people will be receiving pre preventative care and screenings. Mental health will be better. There will probably be less substance abuse. Some people talk about that. A very, very big one is that more children will receive vaccinations. Uh, it would be terrible to trade COVID now for smallpox in 10 years. So don't trade COVID for smallpox. Uh, those vaccinations are important. And to the extent that less vulnerable people are not, not getting medical care screenings, that capacity is limited. Uh, that's something to very much, very much focus on opening, uh, opening up that part of the economy, actually opening up healthcare to more people wherever it's been restricted or where there are some strict limitations in place. Focused protection of the vulnerable should also work better in the short run. Better protocols and protections of nursing home residents and hospital patients will reduce the number of severe cases. And I, I, I just want to add, I'm not, right, this is sometimes characterized as doing nothing, right, or letting the virus run rampant, and it's quite different. What it is, is it's saying, let's take some of the tools we have now and maybe, you know, allow people entrepreneurially to explore new approaches and new tools and make them much more focused, make those approaches much more focused on the vulnerable. So, I mean, what I'm advocating is not do nothing at all. There's plenty to do. Um, I could actually paraphrase that rap video, right? I want plans by the many, not by the few. So that's my, that's my approach. Uh, Steve, let me ask you a, a quick question before we move on to Jeremy. So uh, as I'm listening, it sounds a, a lot like what we already do. So what are the big differences in what the U.S. is already doing? What are the kind of the changes? I mean, I know it differs state by state, but what would be the, the changes that would be in place if, if we started doing what you wanted us to do? Okay, so a big difference, for example, would be not, not requiring, not having mask mandates for everyone. A focused use of masks would be focused on protecting the vulnerable. That would mean that sometimes less vulnerable people would also be wearing a mask to protect them. But again, I, I say go beyond masks, right? Take it really seriously, like goggles and everything maybe, because that's, that's, that's the important difference is it's not keep doing what we're doing. It's take what we're doing, stop doing so much of it over here, right? Stop doing it really what it is is over here, because the idea is by allowing the less vulnerable to interact, to go about things more normally, you're going to get to a point where a significant portion of the population who is less vulnerable has been exposed and developed an immunity. That's the key. Okay. And once a significant portion of the population has reached that threshold of herd immunity, then there's much less risk to everyone, including the vulnerable. Okay. All right. Thanks, Steve. Uh, so, uh, Jer uh, Jeremy, you're up, and the uh, same question. So, what, in general, is the approach you think the U.S. or any country should take? Uh, we characterize it as as Taiwan. And uh, why do you think that's better for public health than what we're we're currently doing? Yeah. Thanks, Howard. And again, thanks everyone for being here. I think, you know, what we've been going through for the past half a year plus is something I think many of us had never expected, many of us had never thought about. So uh, I think we're all learning from each other. And I think that, uh, you know, I've, I've learned a lot actually from talking to Steve. Steve and I are friends. We come from, a, a, we went to the same graduate school, 
think we have a similar kind of outlook on the economy and 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 the social world. So I'm glad to, to be speaking again with Steve and 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 hope to learn more from him. Uh, the approach that you know I would suggest, and, and as we were talking about this event, I, I put out Taiwan as an example of a country that I think did very well. Uh, I think we can't exactly replicate them because Taiwan essentially stopped the virus before it ever got started. Uh, not that they had no cases, but they, they stopped it from getting into their country and they were able to isolate those that, that had it and let the, the virus run its course in that those individuals. And, and then there was, once there was no virus circulating, uh, as long as they you know, keep their borders closed essentially, or monitor people that come in, uh, they don't have to, they don't have, to uh, have uh, any worry about it circulating. Uh, now, can the U.S. mimic that? Of course, we cannot. We have, you know, uh, tens of thousands of cases circulating here now. But I think we can learn from that approach and look at what they did. And I think, you know, one of the things that I like about Taiwan is they were able to do this suppression of the virus uh, without having these kind of general lockdowns or shutdowns that the U.S. and Western Europe and now a lot of the world is trying. They, they didn't have to tell people to stay at home. They didn't have to shut down businesses in general. Uh, what they did is they very dramatically increased testing. And it's true not just of Taiwan, but of places like South Korea and of Japan. Uh, they dramatically increased testing uh, right away, right back. This is back in January and February. Uh, so long, feels like a long time ago now. Uh, they dramatically increased testing when someone was identified as having the virus. They were, they were isolated. Uh, they tracked people. So there's some invasion of privacy to some extent, uh, track people with, with their cell phones to make sure they were isolating. And they isolated until they had a negative test. And then once they were not uh, infectious, people were allowed to move around. So uh, how can the US learn from this today? What, what should we be doing differently? Or what should, you know, as we saw in the the charts that Howard showed at the beginning, you know, places like Belgium and France uh, and Spain that are having, again, massive increases in cases, what should they do? Uh, in some sense, it's uh, less of kind of the strategies that seem to be very popular, the very popular policies by uh, governors and mayors and, and the heads of state in other countries is to try to lock down areas where the virus is spreading, to get everyone to stay home as a way to try to do that. Uh, the problem is you can't make everyone stay home. Uh, there's always, they say, you know, everyone, oh, except for essential workers. Oh, and you can go shopping uh, because you can't literally make everyone stay home for, for three to four weeks. It just doesn't work. People are gonna be out there. People are gonna be doing, so the virus will keep circulating. What you need to do is identify those that are positive, that have the virus and to have them isolate. Now to do that you know, in a country as large as the United States, both population-wise and, and geographically, uh, you do need a lot more testing than we've ever done before. Uh, months ago, when, the, when this was first circulating in the US back in the spring, uh, we just did not have the testing capacity to do this. Uh, so people have been talking about, we should test more, we should test more. Uh, we actually now have a way to do it. So when Steve talks about we should, you know, focus the testing on those who are vulnerable, uh, I think we don't actually need to do that because we have new testing protocols, which are almost as good as the, as the standard tests they've been using. Uh, they can be done very cheaply and very quickly. Uh, one of the most promising ones is called Saliva Direct. It's a saliva test. Uh, it, it's much less invasive on your body when it's done. Uh, but one of the advantages is it doesn't require, it just requires some clean receptacle. There's no special testing material. It's very easy for essentially any state health lab to set up and test these right away. Uh, this test was actually developed by the NBA, the National Basketball Association, because uh, they had a controlled environment to test a lot of different protocols. And they found this was a very cheap, easy way to do it. And Yale University researchers were studying this and they developed a protocol that anyone can copy. So as one example of someone who's actually used this, uh, the University of Illinois, their main campus, uh, the Urbana-Champaign campus, has been testing every student every week since their campus has been open two months ago and they have 50,000 students. They have done 650,000 tests in just the two months they've been open with the saliva test. Uh, that's more than many states have done for the entire pandemic. 
right? One college campus has done this. And what they find is that when they've done this, they find a half a dozen positive cases every day. They isolate those, they're testing everyone and they're able to isolate those that, that don't have them. They've been able to stay open. Now it's not totally normal. They're still wearing masks. They're still practicing social distancing, right? So it's not totally as normal, uh, but they haven't had a shutdown as many college campuses have. Um, and I think that's something that, that states can look at doing this to greatly increase their testing capacity. And a couple of states are doing it. So Minnesota, Florida, and New York are just now getting these off the ground and setting up testing sites that anyone can go to and do this very quick test. And the results come back very quickly. Whereas a lot of the other tests are taking four to five days to get back, which is pretty much worthless by that time, you know, unless you're, unless you're perfectly isolating. Um, so I think that ramping up testing capacity is extremely important. I think we're gonna talk about testing a little bit more later. Uh, let me also kind of say why I don't agree with, with everything about Steve's approach, even though I think there are a lot of benefits to it. Uh, I think one of the biggest challenges with the focused protection approach, uh, partially Howard said, we've already been trying to do that kind of, and it just hasn't worked very well. I mean, everyone who's extremely vulnerable, as far as I know, people I know are isolating and they have been for seven months and they're kind of sick of it, but they, they keep doing it. So we're, we're already isolating the vulnerable to a large extent, but also on top of that, if we talk about trying to isolate all the vulnerable, we're talking about, depending on you know what definition of comorbidities you use, there's something like 46% of the US population, adult population that is vulnerable, including something like 20 to 25% of the working age population. That's an enormous amount of people to try to ask them to isolate until what? Uh, until either there's a vaccine or we have reached herd immunity, which we don't know how long either of those things take. Um, so I guess we could, that's one thing I think we could talk about is, you know, uh, uh, how long does this take? And, and I know Steve, Steve, I'm not saying, Steve, tell me exactly how many days does it take, but, but roughly, are we talking about a month? Are we talking about six months? Are we talking about two years? I mean, when do we reach herd immunity? Um, and, you know, and, and, and what's the likelihood that the, the timeline for that is any shorter than waiting for a vaccine? Uh, so I'm, you know, I think we'll talk about the economics and the trade-offs in a little bit, uh, but, but I think I'm as concerned about, as Steve is, about the economic effects of stay-at-home orders and shutdowns. I'm also very concerned about the social effects as well as other health effects, right? We're trying to protect health, but we might be creating other health issues by keeping everyone at home. So, you know, I would like us to be as open as possible, uh, but with the caveat that we actually do need to still practice mask wearing, hand hygiene, social distancing, as much as we can be open to still do those things. Uh, so, so that where Steve and I, I think very much differ is, you know, uh, Steve would, I think, very much encourage people who are not vulnerable not to wear masks because that will help us get to herd immunity faster, right? If if, if 80 to 90% of us are still wearing masks, it's going to take 10 years to get to herd immunity. Um, so, you know, we can't do that. So I think the recommendation of, you know, those who advocate, say, the Great Barenting Declaration or something like it, it has to be not only isolate and protect the vulnerable, but everyone else get to herd immunity as fast as possible. Um, otherwise, we might as well just wait for a vaccine. Um, so, and, you know, we can speculate all day about how long that'll take. But um, I think... That kind of, I hope, lays out kind of where I stand and where I'm different from Steve. Where we agree is, you know, these generalized shutdowns and telling people to stay home and, and shutting down, you know, elementary schools. I don't think any of that, that, that all looks like you're doing something. And I think politicians love to do something where it looks like you're doing something. I think those are just actually not uh, the right approach. Uh, thanks, Jeremy. So, uh, so again, to stress kind of where you're, you, you differ, uh, I'd say Steve wants really focused protection, focused testing, kind of encourage herd immunity, if we can say that. Uh, whereas you want uh, wider testing and uh, in order to stay open as, as, as open as possible in terms of the economy. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. I think we should, we should I think, continue opening. I think states shouldn't go back to shutting things down. Uh, I think if a, if a state is having cases spike, what they need to do is ramp up testing. I think this is one thing we've seen that, you know, as, as cases go up, um, you know, it, it, in fact, some governors say this, well, if we test more, there's gonna be more cases, there's gonna be more panic, there's gonna be more call for shutdowns. That's where we need good leadership to say, 
we're gonna we're gonna test more. Like that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna strongly encourage people to wear masks. I'm I'm ambivalent. I mean, I'm a little bit opposed to mask mandates, but I, but I, but I would actually be much more in favor of a mask mandate than a, than a shutdown of businesses. I think that's a much less invasion of liberty, and I think it actually is much more effective. So let me let me uh, ask Steve a follow up question. Uh, so you kind of mentioned herd immunity, and I think Jeremy stressed that this might be a, a significant part of what your you know your plan is hoping for. So what are kind of the best guesses that you're aware of on how long it would take, and uh, you know what's the percentage of the population that you need to have for this to to be uh, you know taking a big bite out of the pandemic? So the second question is tougher in terms of what percentage of the population, because that actually depends a lot on the virus and it depends a lot on the, on the population. So for example, it's a higher threshold for herd immunity in urban populations than in rural populations. Uh, that's, that's an important feature. So that, that's something to, to keep in mind. How long does it take? The best estimate is three to six months. Uh, it was much quicker, for example, in the urban parts of Sweden and New York City. So, I mean, what I, what I love about the, the question of herd immunity is, you know, people who know what it is, look at the numbers in New York, look at the patterns, have been looking at them for the last seven months, and New York City is at its past herd immunity. It passed herd immunity quite a while ago. What, what I think people don't understand is, it's like I said earlier, that does not mean there's zero virus, zero cases, zero hospitalizations, or even necessarily zero deaths. It means that they have all fallen to a very low, relatively stable level. It might rise a little bit, it might fall a little bit, but it's very low because there's a very low transmission rate. What herd immunity does is it slows the transmission rate down greatly. The, I would almost say there's not really a way to totally eliminate a virus. Even viruses where we have very, very good vaccines, like for polio, it still pops up here and then in different parts of the world. So, you know, the idea of eliminating a virus forever, viruses are good at what they do, which is surviving. So that when I say, when I say herd immunity, I am not saying the virus goes away and we don't have to worry about it anymore. It's, it's, it's still there. What it is, is it's no longer an epidemic. It becomes an endemic. It's still reproducing, it's still being spread, but at a very low level because there are fewer and fewer uninfected people or really unexposed people that the virus can infect. It's not, and, and herd immunity is not the strategy. The strategy is not herd immunity. The strategy is focused protection so that we can get to herd immunity faster. Pretty much every strategy is a strategy to get towards herd immunity. It's just how do you get there? Uh, if you want to wait for a vaccine, the idea of a vaccine is to create herd immunity with the vaccine, to administer the vaccine to enough people that the virus can't be spread, can't be replicated, or infections can't be replicated very quickly. So, I mean, I, I mean, even right, I mean, I, I think Jeremy's approach still is sort of a herd immunity approach. It's just, he's trying to make it the softest landing possible while still having a good amount of economic activity. And I really appreciate a, a lot of Jeremy's points. Um, I'm, 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 very, I'm, I'm very big on testing and I think we're gonna have a very interesting conversation about testing because I do think a lot of it hinges on the type of test being used and how and what the protocols are. Well, so I'll, I'll go next to, to Jeremy about uh, testing, since you're uh, strongly in favor of testing. Uh, now, you, you said it, it'll be, uh, it's gotten a lot cheaper. And, you know, so University of Illinois was able to, uh, to do a lot of testing. And that was of, of students. Uh, and students are, I don't know if they're higher risk of catching it and spreading it because they gather together. But they're certainly in the lowest, one of the lowest groups in terms of uh, of, of dying if they if they do catch it. So for for testing throughout the general population, because on a college campus you can you can you can do more controls. How do you roll it out in an entire state to say okay? 
I mean, would you require, would you, would we need testing of everyone every week for your plan to be effective or can you do it sporadically or, or what have you? Well, I think what you're saying is correct. You, you can't, I mean, a college environment is to some extent, you know, a controlled environment, right? And you can't replicate that at a state level or national level. But I think what you can do is make it just very widely available. So for example, it's, it's just not widely available in a lot of places now. So, um, you know, I have, I have friends in South Dakota where, where there's, you know, pretty rapid spread and case growth right now. And, and they say to get a test, first of all, you have to have symptoms and then you have to go wait in a line for over an hour. And then you have to wait five days to get the results back, uh, in which time you have to isolate. And, and this is, you know, kids have to pull out of school. Uh, I think what, what a state could do is, and a lot of states have done these, do mass testing sites in say cities or counties where the, where there's case growth, right? Where, where there's some observable case growth just from symptomatic people coming in. You go into that county and you say, anyone that wants to can come and take a test. If you have insurance, we'll take it. If you don't, it'll, it'll be paid for. Uh, and so to set up those mass testing sites and to use tests that are quicker and to use tests that are you know, ones that people aren't scared of, you know, people are worried about, you know, the big thing being stuck up your, your nose, people, people are just scared of that. So I think you need to make it as easy as possible. Uh, you know, whether you need to mandate it or not, I think that that's, that's something I would not do in general. I think you might mandate it for schools. Uh, I think you might mandate it for, for entering certain types of public spaces. Um, I think one thing you could try to do though is pay people to take, to get tested, say, you know, come in and take a test and we'll give you 50 bucks. Um, I think offering incentives for people to get tested, whatever a state can do, especially when they're seeing high case growth, to do that. Because the goal here, right, where, where you know, Steve says, you know, my approach also is kind of a herd immunity approach, but I want to do it with a vaccine. That's true. But I think there, there's a strong case that we could try to, in large part, suppress the virus before we would get to herd immunity, which would mean there'd be a lot fewer people that would die, right, to get the virus as suppressed as possible. Um, and then to uh, the way that, you know, a lot of European countries seem to have suppressed it throughout the summer, and then it came back and, and everyone, I think a lot of people now are saying, well, I guess that didn't work. Uh, the trouble is uh, all of them saw their positivity rates continue to increase, meaning you have a larger percent of the tests are positive as cases are going up. And this means that they just, they just weren't set up to test a lot, right? They, they were not, they did not have these test sites ready to roll out. Um, so I would say, you know, in, in general, uh, states should make it as easy as possible to get a test at all times. When there are counties or cities that have increases in cases you, they can observe, then they need to really focus and really strongly encourage people to get tested in that area. So you, you mentioned uh, South Dakota. So that was, I'll just ask about South Dakota to maybe clarify uh, the point you're trying to make. So South Dakota was well known for never shutting down. Uh, you know, they were, the governor was very proud of the fact that it was one of the least restrictive states. But uh, in your view, the, the evidence is that it's not that part of it that was why things are taking off. It's that the testing was really uh, inadequate. Because as I, I sent you yeah. a, a tweet the other day, they're testing at a much lower rate than say Missouri. Yeah. Uh, but we're not having uh, you know such a huge spike. So right. they're certainly well behind in testing, but you think that the evidence is that that's where the big failure is? I think that is, I think also the, uh, the rate of mask, mask wearing, self-reported mask wearing in South Dakota is the second lowest in the country. The only one lower is Wyoming, which is even more rural than South Dakota. Um, so I think you know, the, the governor there has been very proud of the fact that there's never been a general state home order. There's never been a general shutdown of business, although some of the bigger cities have done it from time to time. Um, uh, there's never been a mask mandate. Uh, but not only has there not been a mask mandate, the, the governor has been very nonchalant about it, saying, well, wear a mask if you want. If you think they don't work, then don't wear one. There, it's, there's, it's, it's been essentially that. Sort of, I'm sorry, we have like environmentally friendly lights in here so they go <laughs> off, they don't move a lot. Uh, but now you can see me like a ghost. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that the testing level there has always been low. And as, te as cases have increased, um, they now have had in the past several weeks 30 to 40% of the tests that they do are coming back positive, right? So 30 to 40%, what that means is you are really only catching the people that are, that are symptomatic. You are missing tons of people that are asymptomatic. Uh, when you see, uh, you know, there's essentially the way I've tried to look at this and a lot of people have different ways to look at these things, but there's two numbers you gotta look at the same time. 
are cases going up and is the, the percent that are positive going up? If both those are going up, you have a serious outbreak that's eventually going to lead to lots of hospitalizations and lots of deaths because you're not controlling it. Some states occasionally, I think Steve and I talked about this probably months ago, you know, North Carolina saw cases going up back in this, you know, in the in the spring and summer, but they never kind of saw the deaths go up, at least at that time. They have since then. But why was that? The test positivity rate there was flat, right? So they were increasing testing along with cases going up. And that allowed them to identify enough people uh, who were positive such that it didn't get out of control. Um, a place like South Dakota, it's just, as I view it, I've been following it closely because I have family there, uh, including very vulnerable ones. Um, they just have not kept up the testing uh, with the capacity. So yes, I, I would agree with that. Well, so let's, let's, let's thanks, Jeremy. Let's move on to the, the next question. We'll save some of the discussion for later. I've been writing down some questions here. So the sec second question is, um, how, do, how do you describe the economic trade-offs of your, your favorite approach? So is this a significant economic cost that we're with the, what we're doing now? And that Steve, so your suggestion would have a lower economic cost, the economy would do better. And is there a, a significant trade-off there, say in terms of cases and death in the economy? And then Jeremy will ask you the same after, after Steve. Uh, so thanks, Howard. Is there a significant economic cost of what we're doing now? I mean, the answer is yes, but it's it's states have opened up a lot starting in, at the end of April in some states, but but over the summer there has been more opening. There's also been some reclosing, you know, new or old restrictions coming back, you know, going being lifted and then coming back or being eased and then coming back. So there's been there's been a lot of, of variability. Uh, and so the extent of the economic harm obviously depends on how that process has gone. I think the economic harm to the Northeastern states has been very severe. I don't think it's been as severe in Georgia. Uh, Jeremy probably has uh, charts at the touch where he can look at, at, at different unemployment rates and, 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 and talk about that. The truth is there's a bit of a uniformity because a, a lot of what's going on is even with ease restrictions, the restrictions are substantial enough that in many industries, businesses have to keep their doors closed or run, uh, run with much fewer staff because they have much less demand. They're dealing with a lot less. Some of that is due to the pandemic itself but a lot of it is due to the restrictions they have. There are a number of restaurants here and everywhere I go that are just gonna, they're just staying closed. They don't have a way to make it work. Some have a way to make it work, but many don't. Uh, movie theaters, et cetera. Movie theaters are now allowed to be open in many states, but in the meantime, several of them went out of business. So, I mean, that's, that's my, what I would say about focus protection is it reduces those. It does not eliminate those economic costs and economic trade-offs. Um, and there are still some costs, right? There's going to be costs for the government to support the vulnerable to the extent the government's involved in that. There's still going to be a lower level of economic activity uh, because a large portion of the population, Jeremy said, oh my gosh, it's going to be a large portion of the population being, you know, not being isolated, being isolated for small, for short focus periods of time, but they are still going to generally be more isolated than the rest of the population. And there's going to be less interaction with other people. And it will be a large portion of the population. If I thought we needed 90% of people exposed to COVID to get to herd immunity, I don't know what I'd be advocating. I guess I'd be advocating hide, give up, because that's not the case. What we've seen in previous pandemics is somewhere around 25 to maybe 40% of the population is exposed and then you naturally get to that herd immunity level. Again, the virus doesn't go away, but what it happens is the reproduction rate is massively slowed down. Okay, let's so, move on. Uh, Jeremy, what okay. do you think about the economic trade-off? Yeah, I, I think, again- I mean, is it, is it a death and dollars trade-off? Is that really the, the way you'd phrase it? Uh, We're all I friends guess, here. You can I would say not. Anyway, so. Right? Here's what I would say. Again, there's there's things that Steve said I agree with, but I think you know a lot of the economic 
costs that we've experienced are because people are afraid, people are worried, perhaps in some cases irrationally, maybe we have scared people a little too much, but people are worried and they are not gonna stop being worried uh, until we can see uh, cases and deaths clearly go down in this country, which we never had that low part of that's due to, you know, different regions being hit at different times. But the United States has constantly had, you know, for the past seven months, at least 700 deaths per day. Uh, this is this is scaring people. And, and I think the best evidence that, that people are scared, you can look at both South Dakota and Sweden. And, and uh, yeah, don't worry, Steve, I don't have charts at the hand. This is all, I'll just go it from memory here. Um, but, you know, uh, South Dakota, if you look at GDP for the first half, the first two quarters of 2020, uh, South Dakota had a GDP decline that was not the worst in the country, but also not the best. They had a GDP decline that was, they're kind of in, in the top 10 as far as being let least bad. But Washington State, which was pretty hard hit early on, had lots of restrictions. Washington State had a smaller GDP decline than South Dakota, which never had shutdowns. Sweden, I mean, Sweden isn't the, didn't have the worst GDP performance in Europe in the first half of 2020, but they still had a significant decline, even being open. Um, you know, we can quibble about were they a little worse than Finland or a little better than Denmark, uh, but it's been bad everywhere, right? And why is that? It's because people are worried. And so uh, they are staying home. And when movie theaters are open, they're just, they're not going. Um, and so, you know, we could say, well, you know, maybe Sweden is because they're more export oriented. Now they can export. Maybe it's because South Dakota is so dependent on tourism and tourism's down, right? But I mean, we can quibble with those all we want. But the point is that places that stayed open, even places that were more open, they didn't see less of an economic hit. Now, tomorrow morning, I think some of you might know this, but tomorrow morning, we're going to get third quarter GDP data for the whole country. It's going to be a blockbuster number. That's going to be the best we've ever seen. It's a little bit of a figment of, of this weird recession. But I think there's a significant chance that the fourth quarter could be back down because cases are going up in certain regions and it makes everyone just scared. The way to uh, you know, get people to not be scared is to suppress this virus. And to do that, I think the strategies I've suggested, obviously I think they're best, but we need to have something which gets people to not be scared. I mean, maybe that's educating everyone better about the relative risks. I mean, I, I don't know. I, mean, I, I think we've tried that for, for seven months, but I think, I think that's the economic costs are gonna be there as long as people see the deaths continuing in this country. So it's that, you know, a lot of the things I think that summarize a lot of what the, the shutdown was self shutting down even before uh, there were government mandates, right? People point to when the National Basketball Association canceled its season as kind of a turning point when everyone took it seriously. And then there were mandates that were coming out. Yeah. And, and, and I think it's that a significant portion of, say, the economic effect has been uh, voluntary action rather than the government mandates. Right. And I think in some cases, the mandates made it worse. I mean, I think that's why I think those are a bad idea. Um, but I think to the extent they made it worse, it might just be because they scared people even more. Um, so I think that that's, you know, I don't want to say none of it's due to the shutdowns. I think some of it is, but a lot of it's just due to, to voluntary behavior of people just being worried. In some cases, maybe too worried, but certainly uh, I think that's going to continue. Okay, so let's move to the uh, the last of the my set questions, and we'll give quick answers to this uh, about economic policy. So finally, something that we've known, you know, we're experts in not just over the last seven months and having to quickly learn, uh, but you know, there's been debate about having a, a second uh, round of funding or bailout or the CARES Act. For, so, can you just discuss quick or briefly? Do you think the first round of say economic relief or financial relief from the federal government was uh, effective and worthwhile? And then should we have a, a second? So Steve, you're first. Um, I mean, it helps GDP because it necessarily does. Uh, it's the way GDP is calculated. Well, let me put it a different way. Do you think it was a good idea? I think, especially if we talk about the aspects of the, the, not just increasing unemployment benefits, but how much they were increased, it created a disincentive to work. Uh, I mean, employees were calling their employers and saying, please don't open back up when they were allowed to open back up in, in Georgia, for example. 
they were saying, please don't open back up because I will, then I'll have to go back to work. I won't qualify for unemployment anymore and I will make less money, significantly less money every month. So you certainly don't wanna create disincentives to work. You don't wanna slow down the economy, especially if we're talking about less vulnerable people. Uh, so of course, along with focus protection, I would prefer a much more focused fiscal approach uh, to dealing with the economic impact of the virus. Okay, uh, thanks, Jeremy. Yeah, I think, I mean, what was done with, with, the, with the big, the CARES Act in March, I think, you know, I think oddly they, they actually did pretty well on, on the fly. I think, you know, you know, the money for small businesses that were, that were shut down by state government orders, that made a lot of sense. Uh, getting money to people that were unemployed and having it be temporary I think that made a lot of sense. I mean, I think, you know, giving them, you know, you know, more than hundred percent of their wage, I think maybe that was a little unnecessary, but you know, that's, they were trying to do things quickly. The giving everyone $1,200 or basically everyone, um, you know, that was to try to, you know, help people that, you know, weren't necessarily unemployed, but were still impacted. And I guess they thought that was the quickest, easiest way to do it. So, you know, I think that was okay. They did okay with that. I think the next round of it, though, I think that, you know, this kind of general give everyone money, I, I would be very much not in favor of that. Uh, I think, you know, having money for the unemployed, uh, to me, this is something where it should be even more focused. Uh, you know, it, I think you should focus it more to industries that are shut down by state government orders. Uh, now, it does give a, a kind of strange incentive to states to probably, you know, we'll shut down restaurants and the federal government will give our restaurant workers money. Um, but I think that would be actually a much more focused way of doing it rather than doing it for everyone, right? Where you might actually create that incentive to not work that Steve mentioned for some people. Now, for some businesses that are shut down and, and the workers can't go back, but because so many places are open, I think targeting any further unemployment relief would make sense. Uh, to, to circle back to, you know, my, what I've suggested, I think, you know, giving states a lot more money to do testing would actually be extremely effective. So I did this kind of back of the envelope calculation. Uh, and, you know, to do those, those cheaper saliva tests, the federal government could allocate money for everyone to do a test every week for the next year, you know, enough money to do that for 52 tests for every person in the US. And they could do it for about $170 billion, which is a lot of money, but it's about one tenth of the cost of the bills are being debated, you know, that, are, that they're kind of throwing around. Um, so you know, what's going to be in this next bill that they, they if they do pass one, I, you know, there's always some money in there for testing, but I think a lot of money for doing specific kinds of tests and to incentivize states, right? So we I talked about incentivizing people to get tested. I think incentivizing states to do more testing uh, and, and, you know, attaching some money to it, uh, I think that would be something that I would think would be the best that they could do among all the other things they're talking about doing to support states and support businesses and to support workers. Um, to the extent the federal government can incentivize that, I think that'd be great. Okay, thanks. So um, Jeremy and Steve, I'd like to give you guys the opportunity to ask each other questions. It's like, I thought you said this, you something, something. So uh, Steve, we'll give you the first, since we made you talk first on each question, we'll give you the first crack at, uh, at Jeremy. Okay, well, I, this is actually just a curiosity kind of work through it with me. Although, I, I, I mean, I, I've, I've heard the objections, but why do you think there's been such a focus on the PCR test, the nasal swab, DNA, iso, so, isothermal uh, amplification test, which is, you know, takes longer to do, has to be run by a lab, is more inconvenient to administer, right? Why do you think that that has been the vast majority of testing instead of antigen tests, which just look for a specific protein to the virus and can be done with saliva and you can get a test result, uh, not instantly, but very, very, very quickly within minutes. Um, it's a really good question. I, I have puzzled over this too. I'm like, why? And, and, when a few, and when a few states said, oh, we're gonna do the saliva test. I'm like, that's great, but what took everyone, like this test has been available for over two months and you know, why, like, I mean, you know, I, we're both libertarians of a sort. So, I mean, I, I just blame it in some sense on general government ineptitude. Like they've been doing these tests. They think that's the way to do it. Um, I think that, you know, 
there is a, a real worry by some governors that if they test too much, the cases go up and they look bad, especially maybe governors that are up for re-election. Um, so I think just in general, I think, you know, I think obviously every state health department has heard about these things, right? They're not living in the dark. Um, but I think, you know, I, we think about what are their, like, what's their incentive to do this more, right? I think that it's, it's just not there right now. And, and, and they're not as accurate, right? So I think health professionals say, well, the PCR tests are still more accurate. Like the saliva tests are, you know, they give the same results 95% of the time, but not hundred percent. So we want the most accurate test. Um, and, you know, this, it just, it just seems maybe not as quite as professional, like, uh, but it, I think it's a, it's a good question uh, to ask why they're not doing it. But I think now that we are seeing, seeing a few states doing it, my hope is that others will copy it if it's successful. I mean, and it, maybe it won't be, uh, but uh, uh, I think there's good evidence to suggest it will work and that hopefully this will be a case of, of those copying uh, states, copying states that do well, which hopefully is what one of what part our federalist system is supposed to do. All right, so Jeremy, you have a, a chance to, to ask Steve a question now. So you mentioned, Steve, that um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I believe you said that New York City potentially and, and possibly parts of Sweden are at herd immunity. Um, I guess I'd be curious to know, you know, what evidence do you think, what evidence leads you to say that? And, and is there some, you know, level of if, if New York City and Sweden start to see significant case growth, which Sweden has to some extent, uh, at what point would you say, well, I guess they aren't at herd immunity and, and even Sweden being open for, you know, basically open for seven to eight months of it circulating has not hit it. At, at what point would you, would you say that they aren't? So I'm just curious about, you know, about, about your thoughts on that. Cause you've thought about that a lot. Um, if they've gotten near their, and not in cases, <laughs> well, I mean, but so that, we, I, we may have to circle back to testing again at some point, depending <laughs> on what the questions are that people ask, because, uh, Cases and test positive rates are related and there's an important thing. And what I mean is the type of case. So I'm not just, uh, I don't just agree with you that the antigen tests are a better option. I think that the uh, antigen tests are a far better option than the PCR test because I think the PCR tests are prone to false positives, massive amounts potentially. So not cases, but if the hospitalization numbers in New York City were to hit something like half of their previous peak, I'd say, oh my gosh, that they didn't have herd immunity, that, that, that something happened. But, you know, it, you know, it's increased a little lately, but, but it's, it's, it's tiny, it's a tiny fraction of what it was in April. And that's because it peaked out in April. I mean, that's what herd immunity looks like. It looks like a very sharp upslope and a very sharp downslope. If the downslope is softer, what that suggests is somehow, maybe it's just geographically and how people behaved, right? Maybe it's geography, maybe it's how people behave, maybe it's the, the policies, but it suggests that they never really did get to the actual, the actual case peak. Yeah. So, okay, thanks, Steve. So uh, I'm going to start uh, opening up to the questions I've been receiving from the, from the audience, and we've gotten some really good ones. And uh, I'm going to ask the, the last one that just came in. It was out to everyone, but I think it's a good question because, uh, Jeremy, I think you mentioned governors, some governors are up for re-election, maybe they don't want to want to look bad. And my understanding is, I, I think, there, is there a presidential election also? I'm not, I, I don't really pay much attention to these things. Could, but it could be, could be. I know there might be some governors uh, up. So, you know, to what extent, I, I know you can probably go on forever on this question, but to what extent do you think that uh, you know, the government response would be different if this had been an, a non-election year. Even if it was just a, you know, an, a, a midterm year instead of a presidential year. Go ahead, Steve. Um, I, I'm not used to doing this. I'm going to give the politicians a little credit. I don't think the election year question was really on their, I, like, I don't think it was on their minds, especially at the start, I think, I think what's going on now is more a fear of changing course. And that goes for both the governors who, you know, resisted uh, mask mandates, who resisted, you know, business closures, 
as well as for the governors who embrace them. That there, for some reason, it's more about the fear of, of losing face of saying, no, I've changed my mind. I'm just going to go take a totally different route now. Uh, because Jeremy, other what do you think? I don't, I don't see a, I don't see an election driven motivation because a lot of these policies were set up and the governor's courses of action were set up back in March and April when they didn't anticipate it going on this long. Yeah, I think I would agree with, with that a lot. I think, you know, the governor of South Dakota is not up for re-election, but she still seems concerned. I think, I think governors are always worried about, uh, you know, their, their approval ratings, whether they're up for re-election or not. Um, I do think at, you know, the president who says, you know, all sorts of things the president says, but, you know, he has said, well, once the election's over, the media will stop talking about this, right? So, so he's at least suggesting that, you know, uh, this is all, this is all you know, driving fear to try to get him out of office. I, I, I think, you know, so he, he has the opposite claim that it's the, it, it, it's the pandemic has changed the press's behavior, not his. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I think it's a really good question. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's good to think about these incentives that politicians face. Uh, yeah, I think, like Steve said, you know, when this hit back in March, I think people were not thinking, they, everyone thought this would be over by the election. And so everyone's just been kind of reacting. And so, yeah, I, I don't know, if, I don't know how much difference that makes, but a testable prediction, right? We can see if there's any governors that are term limited out, maybe, maybe they, maybe they had different, you know, reactions from those that aren't term limited out, but we'll, we can test that later, I guess. So, uh, one thing that uh, I think we kind of touched on with testing was uh, government bureaucracy. Now, early on, certainly the testing regime was delayed quite a bit because of, I don't know, I'll call it some absolute bungling between the, I think it was the FDA was at blame there, maybe the CDC, where they uh, refused to use, I think it was the University of Washington had tests available and they said, no, 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 we've got our own. Uh, so we're going to do it. And then that didn't work. So that, that set things back a few weeks at least. And I think there's, I'm, things are sped up a lot. Like there were a lot of waivers for uh, things to be approved, but it, it does seem like with the testing and the saliva test, it's the uh, it's kind of excessive risk aversion when it comes to the approval process of, of anything in, uh, you know, with medical, like with, with saliva, say it only catches 70% accurate. It's well, okay, you'd get that. Everyone gets that and then you'd, everyone takes the more serious test if they test positive, something along those lines, but that there, there's this obsessive uh, nature about the bureaucratic process for approving uh, things in medicine, which is fine in general uh, or normal situations, but maybe that's been stretched a little too far and maybe that has cost us during the pandemic. Any, any views? Yeah, I guess I can go first this time. I mean, I, I think, you know, this is just in general how the FDA reacts given the incentives they face, right? They, they don't want to have something getting out there which ends up causing a scandal. So it's better to suppress things and then you don't see the bad things from it. But I think we are indirectly seeing from the FDA not allowing these tests early on when, when there were tests being developed back in March uh, that they just were not allowing people to use. Uh, I think that, you know, the saliva test, I've talked about that a bit because I think it's kind of new and a lot of people haven't heard of it, but the antigen tests are, are another alternative. But I'm in favor of, you know, letting private companies develop other tests and people can just take them, right? So I think a lot of people just want to know. There's a lot of people, not everyone do this, but a lot of people just want to know, do I have it right now? And if they do, they would isolate, but they can't go in and get a test. Um, so I, I'm very much in favor of, of letting a lot of experimentation happen and letting, uh, you know, the big worry is, is a false negative, right? If there's a false positive on a test, I mean, then you isolate it for no reason. You know, it's not that big a deal, right? But uh, like a lot of these tests don't have a ton of false negatives as far as, as I know, and I'm not, I'm not a scientist uh, of that nature, but um, I, I think that, you know, the, the bureaucracy does get in the way. And I think they, they've granted like the saliva test is under an emergency use authorization, which means that, you know, I mentioned the University of Illinois is using it to test. Now they want to expand that to like the city and the county that's located in, but they can't even do it. They're not allowed to do it because the emergency use authorization is only for that campus. So, so they can't actually do it in the broader community in, in Illinois, which is having significant case growth too. So I think that there's another case of the bureaucracy getting in the way. And these are primarily federal level uh, bureaucracies, right? So it's the FDA? Yeah, FDA and CDC to some extent. Yeah. Uh, so Steve, do you have any comments on that, that question? Um, 
you know, in terms of the why, I mean, I would love to find out that, that I'm, I, well, I, would I love to, right? Part of me says, oh, there must be some sort of, you know, wild public choice explanation, but I just don't, I just don't, I don't see it. I, what I see is what Jeremy says, bureaucratic ineptitude, uh, but it's, 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 a, it's a pretty big deal because Jeremy's right, there could have been, not, and that's the thing is, we're, on testing, we're maybe only this far apart because it's just, I, I'm saying the tests are scarce. I'm taking that as a given, right? So what do you wanna do? You want to focus testing on the most vulnerable and you wanna test them as frequently as possible. Jeremy is saying, why don't we just test everybody as frequently as possible? And I'm like, yeah, that could be good too, <laughs> right? Uh, that would certainly make uh, that would certainly make the the fatality rate look smaller, and that would certainly lower the test positivity rate. And I mean, but it, in terms of what to do with that information, that's where we that's where we come apart a little bit, because I would say that's very valuable information, a positive test for someone who. Uh, is vulnerable, which means you want to take it very seriously and we need to really focus the best medical care possible on those people. Or it's someone who knows that they're regularly in contact with vulnerable people and then it becomes very important for them to isolate and, and stay away. But in a lot of situations, the positive test would mean, okay, so long as other people are comfortable being around me, put it out there, maybe we should all wear a uh, okay. So your, your idea, was if you get a positive test, you don't isolate, you just wear a red hat or something. Right. Okay. Uh, so here's a, here's a question. Um, and we don't have to go into too much detail on the answer, but there's a lot of discussion uh, about the accuracy of measures, you know, are deaths actually COVID deaths? There was something came out, well, only 6% were purely COVID. Are we overestimating, overcounting? Are the incentives there? to overcount, to declare something a COVID death. This is uh, not much worse than a flu. So can you each of you uh, comment on just in general, how accurate the data collection is and how accurate the numbers are in reflecting the number of deaths that are attributed to, the, to COVID and also, uh, yeah, I guess the number of deaths uh, primarily because that's, that's where, what it comes down to. So Jeremy, why don't you go first? Yeah, I think uh, it's a really good question because I think we need to think about those incentives and, you know, were these, you know, this is just another disease that ends up killing people who are going to die anyway. Uh, the best way to look at that is there's a measure called excess mortality or excess deaths. And the CDC tries to update this every week of there's a normal level of deaths that happen and you can use a baseline of, you know, last year or last five years or last 10 years. Uh, but kind of regardless of the baseline you use this year in the U.S. so far and, you know, it isn't always update with the latest week because there's a lag in reporting deaths, but um, kind of the best estimates I've seen is so far in the US, there have been 300,000 extra deaths, more than we would have expected based on normal historical baselines. So the official count now is up to, I don't know, 220,000. Uh, the number of excess deaths is about 300,000, which means that maybe some deaths were attributing to COVID, which we shouldn't have, but there's actually other deaths happening uh, that, that uh, are possibly related to that, but aren't being counted. Some of those deaths could be related to shutdowns and lockdowns, right? It could have caused an increase in suicides, right? I mean, all these things are possible, but there does seem to be a, a very significantly elevated number. If we look at Sweden, I've looked at that data a little bit. Uh, the excess deaths numbers for the first half of the year in Sweden are almost exactly the number of reported deaths for COVID. It's about 5,900, almost, you know, to the, almost to the, you know, the first digit, uh, so Sweden, Sweden actually has, Sweden classifies them very highly. If you've had COVID in the last 30 days, they count as a COVID death, uh, but that very closely tied to their number of excess deaths. There's some other interesting stuff about the Sweden data, but we won't get into too much detail, but from everything I've seen, the deaths are either accurately counted or they're undercounted in most countries. Thanks, uh, Steve, anything to add to that? I, I don't believe deaths are systematically overcounted. Uh, there are, Sailing in examples out there, you know, there was the county in Florida where a medical examiner responded to a reporter by saying, well, one of, we know one of the people uh, who we, one of the young people we reported from, uh, of dying from COVID, he didn't have any comorbidities. 
morbidities because he died in a motorcycle accident. And so, you know, that, that goes all over the internet and everyone makes a big deal out of it. But those are very rare instances. Uh, I don't believe that the deaths are systematically overcounted. I think that actually because of the prevalence of PCR tests, which is still the vast majority of tests, and I mean vast majority, like Jeremy, I, what would you guess? 95% of the tests, 98% of the tests are PCR yeah, 90%, tests. 9%, 9% at least in most states, yeah. Right. Uh, and those, I believe, especially if the virus has been in that state or that region or that city for quite a while, those, in my view, are going to systematically overstate the case count and the case growth. And I think that's what's, I think that's what's been going on. Thanks. So uh, I have a question about the evidence about the effectiveness of masks. Now, this is actually not a medical question because uh, a lot of the evidence that I've seen has been by economists trying to use panel data to find if places that had more mask wearing had lower rates or, or what have you, because it's not just does a mask stop the virus, it's does the population wear masks properly? Uh, you know, what are the statistical patterns do you see uh, mask wearing being related to lower rates of infections and deaths? Uh, so what are, uh, what's the evidence that you've seen overall and just the effectiveness of, of, of mask, say mandates versus not having them or maybe just mask wearing in general? And again, not a medical question, so we don't have to talk about the, the micrometers of, a, uh, of the virus or anything, just the, the patterns that we see in the, in the data. Go ahead, Jeremy. Yeah, I mean, we don't have to get into the medical too much, but I think, you know, there's no doubt that, you know, an N95 mask worn properly does physically stop it, right? But, but our question is, you know, socially, given we know people aren't wearing everything properly and some people just have a, a, a bandana over their mouth, right? You know, there's been a lot of studies that try to look at this. The data is not super good yet, but, um, you know, the evidence that I've seen that looks at, you know, say states or regions of countries that have, that have rolled out mask mandates, not all at once, right? So they said, did it to different counties at different times, have shown that it does reduce the spread of the virus. It doesn't stop it, right? Masks are not a panacea. Masks alone are not going to stop the spread of it uh, because first of all, compliance is never 100%. It's not perfect. A lot of transmission from some studies I've seen actually happens in the home so one person gets it out there in the world and then they infect everyone in their household. Um, and no one's gonna wear masks in their household, right? So, um, but I, from what I've seen is that, you know, mask mandates, which I think are good things to look at, even if you don't like them, they're good things to look at because it, it's a discrete event, a mask mandate is imposed and it does seem to pretty significantly reduce case levels. And that's even controlling for, um, you know, testing levels and so on. But the data is not super good I and mean, we're working with what we've got, but from, from what I've seen, there is evidence they, they reduce it, but they don't nearly eliminate it. Now, I, not to get too much, but I think it was a, I think we shared a, a, a study in Canada because Canadian provinces staggered the, the time. Yeah, I think that was, that was regions of, of regions Ottawa, of which is where like 40% of Canadians live in Ottawa. And then yeah. it was like, there's like 37 regions of Ottawa. Yeah, so that was more. Ontario. Yeah, Ontario, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Steve, do you have any any other takes on the evidence? Because it is there's you can find correlations for everything. A lot of correlations out there. Yeah, well, it, it's interesting because for a while there was a study, but again, the data aren't great. There was a study that suggested that masks don't so much slow transmission or case growth as they reduce the viral load that people receive, and so it results in less serious infections. But I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know, I don't know about that, but there's something intuitive, especially since a lot of masks that people wear are very imperfect, that maybe that's what it is. It just reduces uh, how much virus someone sheds. Uh, the, other, the other thing, the other type of, of, of look at it that, that I don't know is, or that, that, that's been talked about lately is less mask mandates because the truth is it may differ a lot from place to place, even when a mandate's in place, how much compliance there is, and instead just how prevalent is mask wearing. Uh, the problem is that has to kind of by default has to be survey data. And so there's all kinds of problems with that. And I, I think that's somewhat inconclusive. I know Jeremy's looked closely at it, but I, I, don't, I don't find it persuasive that, that it's even a good measure of how much masks are being worn. 
Thanks. So here's a, a question from uh, from our friend Tom Utterback. Uh, so this is a good one. So well, I'll I'll translate uh, Tom into uh, something less. I don't know if inflammatory is the right word, but he has exclamation marks even when he doesn't write them. So what about uh, outbreaks in places like prisons? So you have, I and mean, this is a significant portion of the population. Turns out, you know, millions some or more people. And there have been outbreaks, uh, maybe they're isolated by prison, but within prison it goes, uh, can spread very rapidly. So uh, maybe, maybe an analogous thing is a, is a college campus because it's isolated and you can control the group. So do you have any, any thoughts on uh, what to do in, in situations like, like a prison environment? Uh, Jeremy, why don't you go first? Well, I think the prison environment is very difficult, uh, even though they, it is a controlled environment and to a large extent, you know, they, they do try to at least control the lives of the prisoners, even more than a college student. Um, so um, I, I don't know if, if any prisons have, a, this is, it's, it's also actually a great place where you can experiment, you know, how well do masks work, how do, you know, it's just rapid testing work. Um, so I, I don't know actually what you should do. Uh, I mean, it seems like it just does spread once it gets in prisons. I am curious, and maybe Steve has looked at this, uh, so I'll ask him, you know, have there been any prisons that have hit herd immunity? Uh, it would seem like it would be a place where you would hit it very quickly. Um, and, and are there prisons where essentially it stops circulating because a large enough threshold has it? No, so, so let me, I think I, I do remember reading a study saying that the, uh, the way prisons have been trying to control it is to keep it out of the prison, but that there they're, there's, seems that there's not much they can do once it gets in. So, okay, go ahead, Steve, if you know. Yeah, so my impression, what's weird is that all that I've seen so far are news articles uh, that document, you know, the spread within prison walls. And there, there's actually two uh, kind of unexpected things. Is, well, is it unexpected? People then post hoc have, a, have or not, not, right, have, a, have an explanation. But uh, one thing that happens is obviously it spreads very, very quickly. And once it spreads, you know, I think I think someone asked a while ago, um, well, how do we, you know, do we even know that infection confers some sort of long-term immunity? And the answer is yes, because millions of people have been infected in the U.S. And last I checked, two have been reinfected. That's the, those are, they're the exception that proves the rule. There's a long-term immunity. What's not long-term is the antibodies. What is long-term is memory cells, especially uh, T cells, they're able to recognize the virus and destroy it as, as soon as it's attacked in the body. So you can be continually, you can be exposed over and over again and still fight it off. And so that's what's happened in prison populations is it runs through the population very quickly. And then if it comes back into the prison, they, they, there's, there's, there's no reinfections. So that's, that's an extreme version of herd immunity. Now, uh, Jeremy's right, what would be interesting, maybe not safe, well, until it's gone, would be to go into prisons and do some really, you know, uh, focused research, trying to figure out where that threshold was in the prison population. But we have to remember, uh, the threshold, first of all, is going to be very high because it's because they tend to be very close together. Uh, you know, you know, Tom's question of do economists even care about those people in prisons? Well, I worked on prison reform in Alabama for the last few years, and I cared about it so much I was willing to work with the SPLC and the Alabama Appleseed and the ACLU. And, That's why I and translated the question on that project. So yes, I care about the people in prison. I care about improving the conditions a lot. So the 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 key there though is because so many prisons in America, especially in certain states, are so overcrowded. Uh, you know, they're sometimes at 187% of their design capacity, 200% of their design capacity. It's going to be a high threshold for herd immunity, but they're still achieving it uh, because it happens quickly. The weird thing, I don't want to say weird, but it's unexpected to me, is that when you look at this, the, the number of hospitalizations and deaths are minuscule. As a matter of fact, in some prisons, it's been zero, even though it runs through the population. And there are many, there are many elderly people in prison. That's actually a major problem. Uh, with our prison system is that the it's it's a terrible environment in terms of a virus spread because the vulnerable are right there with the less vulnerable. Okay, uh, thanks. So one one more question. Um, and if any parents are out there, uh, I don't know, you guys have have young kids, maybe school age kids. 
So what's the evidence or about schools? Should schools just be wide open? Uh, should they be open with protections? What do you think quickly, uh, each of you, what do you think the policy should be towards uh, schools? So this is K through 12. Jared. Yeah, I think this has been studied a lot. Uh, Emily Oster at Brown University, an economist, has studied this a lot throughout the pandemic. And so um, I think there's a lot of evidence that you can have schools open and you know it doesn't transmit a lot and, and kids aren't very vulnerable. I mean, the thing you have to worry about is you know transmission happening in the school and then it being, you know, infecting people outside of it. So I think that's but that's where you know I think individual families have to think about that, right? If you have vulnerable people in your home then either they need to be isolating or a lot of almost every school district that I know of has an option for virtual. So uh, I think if you don't have vulnerable people in your household, I think keeping the schools open is extremely important. A lot of kids are falling behind uh, because of this. So I think that that's one area where I think you know, shutting down bars. Okay. I love going to bars, but it's probably not that huge of a deal, but I think shutting down schools has huge long-term consequences. And so I think that's one thing which there's a lot of evidence that it's fine to open them up. And I think it's really important that they, that to the extent we can, we keep them open. I think there should be testing a lot in schools too, uh, but, uh, but yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, Steve, what do you think? Um, well, I just appreciate Emily Oster's framework. She, she actually says we should be thinking about trade-offs uh, on a large scale. And that is, that's consistent with the Great Barrington Declaration, where she certainly would not be a signatory and where she would depart is that, like part of the reason like she would say close bars. Uh, my view is hopefully going to bars is completely voluntary. And that's a situation where everyone who's exposed to the risk should sign on to it. And if there's an issue with the employees or employers are vulnerable, then that's where Aid should be directed. That's where maybe people shouldn't be forced to work, or there are obviously workarounds or obviously entrepreneurial things that owners could do to make sure that the workers are are very well protected. Well, and I'll, I'll add that I, I think the uh, you know universities are kind of a test case for this. So our big fear, Lindenwood has been open, but with lots of precautions. But we've had hybrid classes, we've had in-person classes with options for students to go virtual or not. But, the, and the protection has been geared a lot towards the faculty because we're the old ones. You know, 18 to 22 year olds are not the, they're, they're not as likely to uh, have, have it fatal. And uh, I think it's actually worked pretty well. I think I only saw one faculty or staff in the data who had caught it. Maybe it's more, I haven't, haven't caught it, but uh, that the protect, you know, if you, within a school, you protect the vulnerable within the school and the kids themselves are at the lowest risk then maybe the university lesson is uh, useful for applying to what K through 12 might look like. But, you know, I don't have any kids. I have my own trouble with my, my kids. I had a, my daughter caught, caught COVID on day three of being at the uni University of Nebraska. So summa cum laude. <laughs> uh, well, I think we're, we're out of time. Uh, so I really want to thank our speakers. So let's virtually clap for our, uh, our speakers. And I'd like to thank all of you for attending and for sending some great questions. Now, I want you to remember to just Google Hammond Institute and go to our website, get onto our, uh, our email list, and we'll be sending out the link to the video of the event so that you can distribute it. And I hope you really enjoyed yourself and that we'll, uh, we'll see you again, virtually or otherwise. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you, Howard. Thank you thanks, Steve. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jeremy. And thank you, Howard.